Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Hannah, the mother of two wonderful daughters. And this is Mabel, my rare baby. She has an SCN2A mutation, which is a neurological disorder that causes DEE, developmental epileptic encephalopathy. Encephalo being brain and pathy meaning suffering or disease. With SCN2A day coming up on 24th February, I want to raise some awareness by giving an introduction to this genetic disorder. If you want to support the cause and donate, I've left a link to the SCN2A foundation below. Thank you for showing interest on this topic and clicking on this video. It's Mabel's bedtime now, so she's off to sleep. <laughs> Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> Okay, now that Mabel's comfortable, let's get into the video. So I'll be introducing SCN2A from a parent's perspective, not a medical perspective. If you're interested in learning more, I'll leave some links to more in-depth information below. SCN2A is short for sodium channel number two alpha subunit. Very catchy. I know. It's a gene mainly expressed in the brain. This is a flattened out version of the gene and all of the possible sections where a mutation can happen. The real picture of a gene is a big messy ball of nonsense that's a bit hard to get your head around. So it's a lot easier to look at and understand this flattened out version. The SCN2A gene creates a protein essential for a whole chain reaction of electrical signals in our brains. It's very important for brain development and function. When there's a mutation in this gene, it can cause epileptic disorders. They're also starting to find that SCN2A changes are one of the biggest contributors of autism spectrum disorder. Genetic testing is done to diagnose SCN2A disorders. Once diagnosed, you might regularly see a neurologist and a pediatrician, and you should also see a genetic counselor. An SCN2A mutation can be hereditary. There are many people who carry around a mutation that's caused them very mild or no symptoms at all, but causes DEE in their children. It can also occur randomly, as can any mutation on any genes really. The mutation can also exist in the germ cells, so there's a chance that you might have multiple children with the mutation or that all of your children have it. There are many types of mutations that can happen to genes. Truncating, also called nonsense or stop codon. When there is a truncating change, this causes the gene to stop building the protein where the mutation occurs instead of where it normally would. This can make the end product unusable in the brain. A bit like a cake that's been served after only adding eggs and flour to the bowl. Missense mutations. These change the recipe for what protein is being made in the brain. Like, instead of making cake, you've made bread. This might be a manageable substitution or you might have really wanted cake. Insertions or deletions. These either add or take away instructions like anywhere from how hot to preheat the oven or preheating it twice as long to missing an entire page in the cookbook or doubling or even tripling the pages. Frame shift mutations. These can occur when the insertions or deletions conveniently change the recipe from baking a cake to making cheese. Duplication mutations. This is an extra copy of the gene, sometimes multiple extra copies, like instructions to make many more cakes than you need. And lastly, silent mutations, which don't cause disease and you probably don't even realize you have it. For the SCN2A gene, there are two types of changes that these mutations cause in the brain. Gain of function, or loss of function. And this has nothing to do with the functionality of the person. With gain of function, there's more protein than needed flooding through the brain's pathways. There's too much activity for the brain to function normally, and it kind of overloads. Kind of like trying to power your TV remote with a car battery. Gain of function babies usually start having seizures very early in life, sometimes hours after being born. For loss of function, there isn't enough protein. Loss of function children typically have autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and sometimes seizures as well. I suppose not having enough of the protein causes the signals to be a little too slow, or maybe even drop the signal off early in a part of the brain that it shouldn't be. All truncating or stop variants seem to fall under loss of function, and missense can either be gain of function or loss of function, depending on the symptoms. There are categories or phenotypes that help to categorize a person based on the symptoms, and give some idea of what treatments to use or avoid and what you can maybe expect in the future. This is a graph of the currently proposed phenotypes. This is just a rough guide to help build a basic understanding of the disorder. So there might not be any one category that a child perfectly falls into. It's split by gain of function in red and loss of function in blue. The phenotype categories are listed along the second row there. I'll go through Mabel's symptoms. Since she doesn't neatly fit into any one of these categories, she's a great example. Mabel's SCN2A mutation is truncating, so her protein doesn't get fully completed. The mutation occurs right at the end of her gene 
gene here. This causes loss of function for Mabel since her gene doesn't make enough of the protein. She had developmental delays and hypotonia before her first seizures, which started as infantile spasms. She has ongoing epilepsy, mostly tonic seizures, but she's also had the occasional atonic and what we think were focal seizures with impaired awareness. So Mabel falls into later onset seizures in this blue section here categorizing her as loss of function. We can ignore this last column here since Mabel has epilepsy. For age of seizure onset, she fits into the greater than three months section since she was 10 months when she had her first seizure. Her seizure types are epileptic spasms and tonic seizures, so she fits really well here. We haven't tested sodium channel blockers, but we assume they'll make her condition worse. So we're not about to give that a try. Her seizure outcome is ongoing, but she could also fit variable here too, since the seizure outcome varies per individual in this category. Her pre-seizure development was delayed. I've done a video explaining all the delays I noticed. Basically, she was gross motor delayed and diagnosed with hypotonia before for her first seizure. Mabel is too young to determine her developmental outcome, but we feel she fits more in the moderate to severe section at the moment, since she's still able to problem solve and function in some everyday things pretty well, although we're not really sure what counts as severe intellectual disability. For movement disorder, she's had a temporary chorea type movement, not athetosis though, but it was due to medication and completely resolved once they were stopped. So she maybe fits in both here. Both categories in tone abnormality have hypotonia as a possibility. With Mabel having hypotonia, she can fit in both these categories. For other symptoms, Mabel is too young to diagnose ASD and she doesn't have microcephaly macro being small and cephaly being head. She hasn't had any of these symptoms consistently or severely enough for them to be labeled an issue. Like she's had some symptoms of autonomic dysfunction, toes and fingers going blue, randomly hot hands and feet, but only when she's sick or about to have a seizure. And she's not had any ongoing GI symptoms and she isn't suffering with sleep disturbance, although it happens with medication changes. These things may come up as she gets a bit older. For now, she kind of fits better in this category. This last row here tells us Mabel should fit in this phenotype since her gene mutation is truncating, not missense. This phenotype graph over time will probably change as more studying is done and more people are found with SCN2A. SCN2A can cause neurological and non-neurological disorders. Looking at the graph, you can kind of see what symptoms are more likely in which phenotype. In general, epilepsy, focal seizures, ASD, GI dysfunction, and hypo or hypertonia are common symptoms of SCN2A. Some of the neurological symptoms can include seizures of many types, but mainly epileptic spasms, focal and tonic seizures, delayed brain development, cerebral palsy, cortical visual impairment, hypo or hypertonia, dysautonomia. These are issues with involuntary bodily functions like heart rate, movement disorders, such as chorea, ataxia, or dystonia autistic features or ASD, and depression. The non-neuro symptoms can include GI dysfunctions, urology problems, and sleep disturbances. The same variant, the same type of the mutation in the same section of the gene, can present very differently between individuals. This can be due to the rest of the individual's genetic makeup. Some other benign genetic variants could minimize the impact of the SCN2A mutation. The study of this gene is still fresh and ongoing, so new discoveries are happening all the time. There is currently no no cure for SCN2A, but there are ideas in the works, and a theorized cure using genetic editing. Gain of function benefits from medications that block the sodium channel. However, these kinds of medications can make loss of function worse. There is no direct treatment for loss of function, but there are medications that can help manage the symptoms. The outcomes again depend on phenotype and vary in severity. They commonly include developmental delays, seizures, drug-resistant epilepsy, intellectual disability, and autism spectrum disorder. And that's all the basics on SCN2A. If you have any other questions about this genetic disorder, let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up if you learned anything new. If you're interested in helping the research of SCN2A and possible cures, our donation link is in the description below. We're currently working on funding clinical trials in Australia, which is a huge step towards finding a cure. I'll be making more videos, raising awareness, sharing my experiences, some of the things that I've learned so far and what my life kind of looks like raising a daughter with a rare genetic disorder. If you're interested in joining the journey, hit subscribe and the notification bell below. And thank you for your interest in SCN2A.